Lord God, thank you for giving us this opportunity to dig into your word and to uh, understand even better the privilege of prayer. Make us uh, powerful prayers uh, as we learn from you, as we learn from Elijah in our lessons today. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. All right. So um, last time we started this lesson and uh, uh, we're, we've been talking about the importance and the power of prayer uh, last time we talked about the struggle between the, the should be and reality of our prayer lives, where we say, yeah, we've got this awesome privilege and, you know, pray continually. It should be all the time. Uh, but the reality, uh, our sinful nature sometimes uh, um, holds us back on that. Um, we looked at the uh, incredibly bold prayer uh, that uh, Elijah gave to God for the child's life, asking for a resurrection, something that it seems had never happened before. Uh, and today we pick up with two more examples of Elijah's prayers. So uh, the first one from 1 Kings 18, verses 30 to 39. Um, page number? 503. 503. Uh, can I get three readers today? Vicki, Brenda, and I'm Greg. All right. Vicki, you want to start us off? Either read the whole thing or break halfway and take off to Brenda. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. The king of the hill, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elisha took twelve stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two sheaves of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. So the third time he ordered, and they did it the third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. And the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice of the wood, the stone, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God, the Lord, He is God. Okay, thank you. Uh, context. This is Elijah on Mount Carmel. You are probably familiar with the account. Uh, God had sent the famine for three years, and that's where we met the widow at Zarephath. Uh, that's how God provided for Elijah for some of those three years of famine, uh, because God had sent Elijah to tell King Ahab, you are strained from the Lord. You're following after other gods until you repent. Um, there's no rain until I say there's rain, um, because you know, as a punishment for this. And so there wasn't any rain. And so the king's looking for Elijah to try to kill him. He can't find him. He can't find him. He can't find him. Uh, and then Elijah shows up and tells King Ahab's servant, Obadiah, who was a believer uh, in the Lord um, and who had helped preserve the life of some of the Lord's prophets that were hiding in caves. Uh, Elijah shows up to him and says, um, hey, go tell uh, King Ahab, I'm here. I want to talk to him. And Obadiah is afraid, saying, you know, what if what if God takes you away? The king will kill me if I say you're here and then I didn't, I, you know, uh, I didn't capture you or whatever. And so uh, um, Elijah says, just do it. Obadiah tells the king. King comes. Elijah says, let's do a contest to see who's right in this. Um, you have all your prophets of Baal and Asherah come and 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 you make an altar. You know, well, he he had he said, bring all the people here. We'll have a contest, and then everybody gets there, and and the whole nation, um, the big crowd is there watching. Elijah sets up the contest. 
you guys have your altar, build an altar, put the bow on it. I'll build an altar, put the bow on it. Um, but don't put fire to it. And you pray to your God. And if whichever God sends fire, that's the one who's the true God. And Elijah says, you guys go first. So they build the altar. They put the bow on it. They're, they're praying, they're dancing, they're shouting, they're cutting themselves. They're doing all the things that they think will help their God listen to them. Their prayer was uh, very passionate, very intense, very sincere. They believed that this would happen. I mean, they were willing to draw their own blood um, because they were confident in their prayer, but it was to bail. And so it didn't work. Um, and then this is Elijah's part of it. So at the time of evening sacrifice, so all morning, afternoon, and, and into the evening, um, the prophets of Baal and Asherah had their chance. They were praying, uh, repeating themselves again and again, doing everything they could. And then Elijah steps up. And first of all, the water um, over it, just to make it really clear. Yeah, it's not just because it was really dry and it sparked up. Um, this is something big happening. And then he prays. And that's what I want to focus on. Pay attention to the words of Elijah's prayer. Why did Elijah set up this contest and soak his offering with water? Okay. So why did he put an impediment to the burning of the offering in place? So they couldn't explain it in the other way that his God. Okay. So they, they couldn't explain it any other way than this was a God thing. Um, anything else? O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant have been done all these things at your command. Showing his faithfulness, showing what he believes. Okay. Explain that, showing what he believes. How does that prayer show what he believes? It shows that based on what he was taught coming up through the years and him being, you know, of that line, that they would they were calling to believe in God. Okay. It's a true God. It's not a God that's made up or an idol. Yeah. This God has shown and proven itself time and time again. And think about the audience for his prayer. Think about who's hearing it. Yeah. He's praying to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a.k.a. Israel, right? And he even uses the name Israel, which was the name they used for their nation. Mm -hmm. They were the nation of Israel. And so you think he's saying something there? Hey, people that have been following Baal, um, this, is, this is the one that did all those things you've heard about. This is your God of history who's done all of those things. So in his prayer, he is... He's remembering who God is, and he's helping others remember who God is, right? So the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Um, and then what, what is he really asking for? You know, he says, answer me so that these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. What didn't he pray for? Fire. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nowhere in there does he say, send the fire. <laughs> um what is he praying for? Sign. Okay. The fire would be the sign that did what? They would turn back to you. Okay. Use this to turn them back to you. Um, use this for your glory. Right? Brenda. Even in the translation, he didn't say that he will turn. That you are turning, he was actively already doing it. It wasn't like they're in the midst of this, it's not not happening already, yeah. for whatever reason, you know, like that's because you would have thought you would have prayed, turn them back yeah. to you, that that's not to pray. When when did God's work of turning start, or what, what was one point in it, maybe? 
<laughs> yeah, three years. God's been doing what? He's been sending the drought because he hates them? No. Because he loves them and he wants to turn them. And so he's he's in the process of doing his amazing work. And sometimes it is the, the foreign work of punishing, of law. Um, and here is the drought. And now look at, I mean, Elijah's prayer is all about God's glory, right? I, so that these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Um, so, you know, tying into that history, you're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. So you're our God. You're these people's God. Um, do this thing so that they can see, oh, yeah, this is who you are and this is what you are doing. That's a, it's a great point, um, that you are turning their hearts. This is what you do, God. Um, <clears throat> Let's see if we got all my notes on that one. Um, number five, we started into, I guess, why did Elijah want God to answer his prayer? And did it work? Yes. Yeah. They're shouting out, um, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Uh, previously, they had been praying, O Baal, answer us. God of the rain, answer us. Which... It's kind of crazy that three years of no rain and they're still saying, Baal, you got the answers. Um, think about what that says about the power of our sinful nature and our human stupidity, right? Um, we can say, you guys are fools. It's very clearly obvious that this isn't working for you. Um, someone sent me again the uh, honest preacher video have you seen that it's uh mm -hmm. it's on youtube it's uh a parody thing and the the honest preacher gets up there and and uh just starts like ah oh, you know like like crying out in frustration and and says i'm, I'm gonna go away from my prepared remarks for today so that i just have to say guys stop it <laughs> You know, you're being bad. You're supposed to be good. You come in my office and you're like, oops, don't. <laughs> oh, look, it's Jesus. He says, stop it. Right. Um, you know, but but so much of counseling, and I can't even put myself on the other side of this because I run into it the same thing in my life too. Why do I think that reacting in that way is going to work out well? If God says not to, and I've seen a hundred times that reacting in that way does not work out well. Um, and yet I keep reacting in that way to whatever that thing is, right? Um, you know, we we don't learn. And and you know, so I talk, you know, doing counseling, and, and it's like, okay, let's do this, this, and this. And then, well, we decided not to do this, this, and this. Did that work? No. That's why we're back here. Well, then let's try doing this, this, and this. And then Oh, we didn't do this, this, and this. Did that work? No. Well, you know, and it's just that that constant cycle where we know better, but our sinful nature somehow convinces us to go back to that pattern, right? Um, and and here, the the you know the people of Israel, three years of no rain, and they're saying the God of the storm, the God of the cloud, the God of rain. That's the you know that's Baal. That's what's going to happen. Come on, people. Um, but like I said, I got to say that to myself too. Come on, people. Um, and, and so El Elijah prays that that change, that God make, uh, make them realize the Lord is God, not Baal, not whatever we're turning to, the Lord, he is God. Um, what lessons can we learn from this prayer of Elijah for our prayers? Let's do a pair and share uh, finches. You can be a three partner pair and then you two, and if you two want to combine um, come up with uh, as many lessons you can learn from this prayer of Elijah. Thank 
I was like, it's quieted down a little bit. What lessons did you come up with? We'll start with the, the Finch triumvirate back there. <laughs> pray with confidence. Okay, pray with confidence. Uh, God, I know you're God. Um, let's show them this. Yeah, good. Patty and Vicky? Be consistent. Be consistent. Uh, explain that. Like, where do you see the, or why do you, why do you say that in this one? I like it. It's good. But let's unpack that a little bit. Like, what's what's Elijah's consistent attitude here? He's asking, they, like Brenda said, that, he, that he's turning their hearts back again. Okay. So they're, you know, continue to show us, continue to so, pray. Yeah, Elijah is consistent in understanding that God's got this, that he's in control, right? You are doing this, God. Yeah, and so Elijah, Elijah holds to that. And throughout it all, he's consistently saying, um, you're God, I just want people to know that. Right, and it comes up in a couple of different ways. Good, Brenda and Greg. Um, bold and believing. Okay, bold and believing. So, again, that this is what you're doing, God. Just show them. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> one of one of the things I I took from it is uh, holding God to His promises. Right, you know, God had God had told Elijah, "This is what I'm doing." Um, I'm going to send a drought so that the people will know that I am the Lord. Uh, and now here Elijah is holding God to his promise, saying, uh, God, you're doing all this for that reason. Um, so do it now. Uh, think about maybe, maybe a quick brainstorm. Times in scripture where you see prayers holding God to his promise. Prayers saying, God, you said this. Come on now, do it. Said he was raised from the dead after three days. Okay. So the, the disciples should have been praying that. Jesus, you said you're going to rise from the dead. Do it. Um, they kind of forgot that one. Uh, but he certainly kept his word. Okay. Another example of God's promise Right, uh, and so every time they looked at a rainbow, the the believers could say, "All right, God, don't destroy us. You said you weren't going to. Don't do it. Um, we know you're not going to." Okay. Well, I don't think the rainbow like anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I thought of Moses when God said, "I'm I'm going to leave the people," and, and God and Moses says, "No, no, no. You promised us. Uh, you can't leave us. You got to go with us." Um, what will the nation say if you, because that would mean you're not keeping your word. Um, and, and, you know, or how about the wrestler? You know what I'm talking about? It's on, yeah, Jacob. Yeah. Jacob wrestling with God. I won't let you go until you bless me because, you know, on the way, oh, when I was leaving, you promised you were going to bless me. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Um, yeah. Or how many times did Jesus, uh, Father, glorify your name? Um, well, I have, and I'm glorifying it again. Um, I wrote down Psalm 31, 1 to 5, when I prepared this, and I'm trying to remember. I think that's David talking about forgiveness. Um, 
So let's see. Psalm 31, and you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, you know, he just said, be this for me. And then the very next verse, and because you are, because I know you said this. So when I, when I pray it, it's absolutely true because you said it, um, because you are my rock and my fortress for the sake of your name, lead and guide me, free me from the trap that's set for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. So yeah, that was the the prayer of David that um, when he he's holding God to his promises. Um, I, I think of Luther's explanation to the the uh, um, end of the Lord's prayer, uh, where he says, "You know," and we say, "Amen." Yes, it shall be so, because you've you said you're going to do this. Um, we, we know these things are true. Um, so, good. Anything else on this prayer on Mount Carmel? <laughs> then we're going to stay on Mount Carmel, and we're going to see Elijah's next prayer. Uh, we'll read it, and then, same as before, with the partner, come up. So this is what we did last week, where we came up with the three best adjectives to describe his first prayer. Um, about the raising of the widow's son. Now we're going to use that same exercise for this prayer. So it, Greg's turn to read, I think. So Greg, if you want to read it, and while he does, start thinking of what adjectives you would use to describe this prayer. And then with your partner, you're going to narrow it down to the three best ones that you've got. So please, Greg. And then Elijah communicated, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let anyone give away. They seized him and Elijah... Drop down to Kishon Valley and slaughter there. And Elijah said to Ahab, Go eat and drink, for there, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. Go look toward the sea, he told the servant, and he looked up. There was nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, Go back. The seventh time the servant reported a small cloud as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, Go tell, hitch up the chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black and the clouds, the wind rose, the heavy rain started falling, and they had rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he went ahead to Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Okay, so we, we don't actually hear any words of Elijah's prayer here, but he gets down, he puts his head between his knees, and, and uh, we see his activity around his praying time here. So, uh, with the partner, come up with your best three adjectives to describe Elijah's prayer here, and defend each with an explanation. Ready, set, go. <laughs> You got your your three adjectives. 
Thank you. All right. Who wants to give a first one? First head to this group over here. Uh, persistent. Persistent. So seven times. Um, hey, go look again. Go look again. Go look again. I'm praying here. All right. Movement confidence. Confidence. Uh, what parts were you highlighting for the confidence? That would be what he said. Okay. <laughs> He pulled the eight out of the house even before he was started. Okay. Like he was so confident that he was gonna go do the prayer and it was gonna work out. He told yep. the sound coming, what was it to be? Yeah. He brought his umbrella. <laughs> he brought his umbrella, right? Yeah. Yeah. He tells the king, oh, the rain's coming. Yeah. Direction. Direction for the seeds to Okay, so very specific in his direction, right? This is this is what I'm asking for. Um, I want to see the clouds. Uh, okay, good. When did you have to see clouds? He saw a little clouds. He's like, right. this is it, we're done. Here okay. we go. Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, he kept sending him until he saw anything, right? right. Um, I heard someone say, man, that guy's got to get frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> Um, again, Elijah, there's nothing I'm telling you, dude. Uh, okay. So that was one from each. Any that any others? Any other adjectives? Any other these groups? Okay. And believing. Okay. So the, the confidence, the believing, trusting. God's the one who's who's got this. Um yeah, I had. I had confident, right? He tells Ahab the rain's coming before he sees the cloud. He sends the messenger expecting him to see the clouds. Uh, persistent, seven times. I put effective. Um, the sky grew black and the wind rose. Um, I, I, you know, I had the, the trusting, so that amazing confidence. It's been three years since there's been rain. Um, Imagine, I mean, think of what you get used to in three years. And and then just to expect that's totally going to be different. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, maybe some thoughts on this section. You know, you've got, uh, um, yeah, Brenda. Prayer was, so like when he got down um, to the ground and put his head between his knees, is that to be humble or was that to focus himself so he wasn't distracted? And what do we think of the point of that? Yeah, I I think yes. Right. I mean, so there's just a major slaughter. 850 people were just killed. There's probably some commotion going on around that. Um, Ahab is going off to eat and drink. There's a lot of activity. The whole nation was there to watch this. They had just been shouting again and again, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. There, it, there's a buzz, right? Um, and so uh, putting his, his head between his, his, his knees, um, trying to focus, remove those distractions. Um, but then also, uh, certainly seems like there's that humility there too, right? Um, and, and maybe those things could be lessons for us in his prayer, right? That that sometimes it takes some serious focus because our world is trying to distract us from it. And, and that aspect of humility. Humility before a God that has given us promises. And so the absolute... There, there are times in the Bible where, where it almost sounds like you're being rude to God, right? The prayer, you know, Jacob, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. And he was blessed for that. God wants us to be humble in what we can do, but absolutely confident and aggressive in what he can do. Um, and, and so, yeah, he, he's humble, and yet what he's doing is showing that absolute confidence and aggressiveness. But I do think probably the biggest thing here, the way I see it in my head, is he's trying to block out all the distractions and have this, I'm talking to God right now. Yeah. But that's 
what I think. Yeah. That's not thus saith the Lord. <laughs> um, so good. Other things with this account, you know, he 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 kills all the slaughters all the the false prophets. Um, accountability. Accountability. Uh, he he just really mad and and takes it out on them. So this to me is like one of those hard ones. Like sometimes when you're talking to somebody who doesn't mm -hmm. have faith, to understand everybody, you know, like everybody wants to justify their sin and say, "Well, God is love, and He He'll forgive. He forgives, you know, people all of their yeah. sins, no matter what they are." And then here's an example where there wasn't even an opportunity for him. Right, theoretically. Well, for uh, years. Yeah. No, I, I mean, there, you know, this happened and it's yeah. a slaughter, yeah. 850 yeah. feet, right? Yeah. Like that, just versus, because, uh, you know, I don't know, it's when the time comes. Yeah, yeah. And, and, right, you know, when the time comes, it's the time, right? You know, so, so yes, God is forgiving and loving, and part of that love is his justice. I mean, I like with this one, I'll go back to when he gave them the law. And he said, um, don't turn to other gods. And the punishment for turning to other gods um, is to be killed. That the death penalty, and, and for leaving someone in that all the more, right? And so um the fact that you know that was that was in the law that they had all agreed to. Remember this this covenant with the people of Israel, God said, um, all right, I'm gonna read all of this. You good with that? And they're like, absolutely, we're good with that. We will do it, and our children will do it. We bind ourselves by this. Um, thankfully, God is very patient, right? He gave them years and years and years to um, to, to repent. Uh, but there are times when he just says, that's it. And you people that are are destroying my people, um, we're going to agree. Now is that time of, of justice and judgment. And, you know, I, it's hard to think about until you put yourself in that situation, you know, if if someone, um, you know, kills my child, or you know, something worse, and they're brought before the the justice, and the the judge says, "Yeah, all the evidence says you did this, but I'm just going to let you go." Um, none of us is okay with that. Uh, we don't want a god like that. But we want God to say what I'm doing is okay. Um, and, and so, yeah, this uh, scenes like this in the Bible are reminders that God loves us enough to punish sin um, because he wants his people to have his promises. Uh, he wants to forgive our sins. And when we're putting uh, obstacles in the way of people receiving forgiveness, he has to remove those obstacles if he's, if he's loving. Uh, does that make sense? It does. I mean, I, I think it's just as you apply it to your life, as, how do you know when you're at that point where all of a sudden you're slaughtering it? Right? Like in your own. When God specifically tells you and He yeah. has specifically told us, right? Well, but for the end of the night, I guess you probably had a problem with your body in order to do so, but you know, yeah. it was. And, and He had God's law that applied to Him and His people. And He was upholding that. So even if He didn't have that prompting of, from from God, which I, like you said, I kind of think he did. Um, uh, he was doing what God had specifically said, this is what you do. Um, anyone ever read that book about the fundamental, uh, John Krakauer, Under the Banner of Heaven, about the fundamentalist Mormons who killed their family? It's on your list? <laughs> it is amazing um, because well, all of his books, he takes things that seem absolutely crazy. And then he tells the story from the vantage point of whoever's, you know, the yeah, more or less. You know, so he's the one who did Into the Wild about that guy who lived in the wilderness and and uh, um, the one where they climbed Kilimanjaro. Um, he was on that expedition where, oh, what was that one called? Into Thin Air. Uh, but anyways... So under the banner of heaven, he tells the story of uh, these fundamentalist Mormons. And you can see how one false teaching after another. And if you're believing that, well, then this makes sense. 
which is why it's so important to hold to God's word, because he has not told us to go and slaughter 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah. Um, Elijah was living under that covenant and yeah, was uh, was fulfilling it. But yeah, I know it's hard to explain to someone. Um, the, the best I can do is put it into that picture of we want a God of justice. Um, and we don't get to say how and when that's applied, right? Um, but yeah, there's that. Um, you, know, you think of uh, Elijah's attitude and his interaction with Ahab. Um, what's he thinking? Does Elijah think that Ahab has been converted and he's excited to spread the news? So go back to the castle, to the palace, and tell everybody. Um, you know what's going on here? Is Jezebel seeing the rain and thinking? that maybe Baal won, right? Because now there's rain and the God of rain coming. And, uh, you know, maybe Elijah expects a very different reaction when he runs ahead of the chariot. Uh, and then he finds out that he's about to get killed. And the, the next part, he takes off and has his depression bit in the wilderness. But uh, we don't get into that, into that today. Um, number two. This was Brenda's question, too. What do you notice about Elijah's posture of prayer? Any lesson to be learned there? So we kind of talked through that a little bit, right? Two things. He's trying to remove distractions. He's showing humility. Um, what, what's your take on the posture of prayer? What works for you? What suggestions do you have? What's helpful? It's important to remove the distractions. Okay. Yep. You know, it's straight into the distractions. So I'm having a conversation with a person. Like, I'm directly looking at you. Like, with God, it's more internalized. It's very easy to be distracted. Yeah. Yeah. And he's always there. So I can always get back to that. Right? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. And I think the two opposite of that, too, when, when there are a lot of distractions, try to remove it. Any other thoughts, suggestions on posture of prayer? I think that there could be times that there's definitely times in the Bible where the person praying is very outward about it. Like he, they're okay. confident what they're doing and almost, I don't want to say show but it is like they want people to know that they're praying. So I think sometimes like if you go to a restaurant and you pray before you eat, <laughs> right? If you're doing that for yourself, but the fact that you're doing it, other people see you do it <laughs> and it has an impact as well. So recognizing that, you know, sometimes you're saying, well, yeah, saying pray, you would know it's it's good to fold your hands back right? so somebody knows that that's what you're doing <laughs> or whatever. And the, the waitress will wait a second and put it in. <laughs> Let, let's finish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so so yeah, that sometimes there is um, reason for an external display, and sometimes there's reason for not an external display, right? As I'm walking up to a house to make a visit, um, that's between me and God, right? As um, as we're gathering together and as, as we are praying together, it's an encouragement for the others who are praying with us. Yeah. You don't always have to do something physical to be possible yeah. to be in a different position. You can get your heart right first, get your sin yeah. and then, then go into the prayer, just like the model where Jesus taught us. Yeah. Yeah, it might be might not really be a posture, but for me, habit is really important. You know, getting into certain habits before I eat, when I wake up, when I go to bed, when I'm doing my my you guys' prayers, uh, you know, having my book out and it kind of keeps me on track. Um, my list of what I'm praying for. Um, yeah, so I think I think habits and structure is good. And then at the same time, you know, that pray continually thing, uh, that there's always that relationship with God being expressed in, in thought. Good. <clears throat> All right. Um, James 5, 16 to 18 uses this prayer of Elijah as an example for us in the context of forgiveness. Let's read those verses and explain how Elijah's prayers make James point. So we're back to Vicki when we get to James 5, 16 to 18. 
1844. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Yet he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. How does Elijah's prayer, or his prayers here, make James' point? He tells us to pray for forgiveness, and then he uses Elijah's prayer for no rain and then rain as an example. How, do, how does that make his point? God listens. Okay, God listens. Mm -hmm. He says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Okay. So Elijah was righteous and his prayer was both powerful and effective. Yeah. In, in both directions. Yeah. And, and maybe for clarity, what made Elijah righteous and what makes us righteous? Jesus. Jesus, right? I mean, uh, e Elijah, we see in the next story, wasn't the perfect person. Right? He struggled with thoughts he shouldn't have been struggling with. Um, but he was righteous through faith in Jesus. And, and we are righteous through faith in Jesus. And so our, our prayers for forgiveness are heard because we're righteous through faith in Jesus. But there are examples in the Bible where <clears throat> some of at the time that they were in sin and not acknowledging it or willfully disobeying, the prayer that they gave was effective. I can't, I can't think of it, but whatever. Like, because that would say, you know, like, I think of David, right? Against all odds. Like, it, he had a lot of very powerful effective mm -hmm. prayers, but he was also there for a bit, willfully against what God had said, you know, when he killed what's yeah. her name's husband and yeah. her, you know, like, that's during that time where his prayer is still effective. He talks about, in one of the Psalms, he talks about during that time how he cried himself to sleep and his tears flooded his bed and his bones ached and he doesn't describe a good life. Um, <clears throat> there were long-term effects of some of those decisions too. Um, so you're you're asking, was there an example where I mean Somebody was an willfully, unbeliever, yeah, like unbeliever. An unbeliever has a prayer and answers? I mean God used Balaam, the the sorcerer, he used I mean there were times that he used people who were not good people. Uh, to achieve his will. So Balaam gave this prophecy that uh, um, uh, Jesus would come, even though Balaam was not necessarily always making good decisions. Um, or we, uh, so when, when Elijah goes and God appears to him, so he gets depressed, God sends the angel, he feeds him, he goes to Mount Sinai, and um, uh, God reveals himself to Elijah. Uh, and then he tells Elijah, go and anoint Hazael king over Aram, because he's going to come and punish the people of Israel. Hazael was an unbeliever who killed his dad to become king um, after Elijah had said, you're going to be the next king, and, and I'm crying because you're going to do awful things to my people. You know, he was not a believer, and so, but that wasn't really a prayer of Hazael. Um, I don't know. I guess I'm trying to make it that yeah. that's what James is saying here, that if we ever feel like our prayers aren't being effective, is it because there's something that we... Because we're not being right at that part, right? It's never, we're never perfect, but we are willfully disobeying, and that's why our prayers aren't being effective. Does that make sense? Or is that a bad comparison to make? Because I know if you're, I don't know, you're doing some sort of horrible sin and you fall down and you pray to God and say, you know, save him, whatever it is, I would assume that's going to be powerful and effective. Like he's going to say, right. that he's, already, he's already forgiven his sin. So, right? so why are you, you praying to God? It's because 
you recognize yep. you're, you're you're in repentance, right? Um, you know, yeah, the prayer of a believer is heard. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You know that we we don't have access to the Father except through faith faith in Jesus. Um, so, Joseph, I think sometimes sometimes in those situations, sometimes we pray for faith we think we need, but God knows more about what we need, and so you know we're not given those things or those 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 prayers. You know, in our mind, is this the best for us? This is the best for us. But God, like no. No, nah, this is mm -hmm. this is not best for you. This is where I'm gonna take you down. This is what's gonna happen. Not, not okay, so so to the part of the verse that is powerful and effective, what is effective? Is effective getting exactly what I want, or is effective uh God one doing what he promised, which absolutely, um, and two doing what he promised is what's best for us, not necessarily, you know, Lord. Help me win the lottery. Yeah. Uh, that may not be the, the most effective way to answer that might be no, that'd be bad for you. Exactly. Right. Um, so yeah, it's powerful and effective, not necessarily whatever we want. I, I think of where Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, I will give to you. So in the sphere of our relationship with Jesus and what he's done for us, what are we asking for? We're asking for his will to be done, right? Um, and he's going to give that. Uh, he, he made that promise. Um, then James talks about uh, your motives. Mm -hmm. You do not get because you ask for the wrong, you have the wrong motives and mm -hmm. for your own pleasures. Yeah. Instead of to the glory of God, which, you know, when we looked at Elijah's prayer there, um, again, it wasn't send the fire so I look good because it'll really be embarrassing if you don't do this. Uh, it's Lord, glorify your name. What I'm saying is, like some of our some of our wants look so much like our needs. In other words, to us, I need this to happen. I need this to happen. But really, it's just a thought, and God is the one who He knows what you need. Yeah. But he also pointed out that Elijah was human. He wasn't a god or something. Okay. And he also knows the word because of very big prayer and mercy. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Number four is, we don't have time for, um, Luke 18, 1 to 8, is uh, um, Jesus talking about the the widow who kept, we she came up, one of you brought her up last week, the, the widow who kept bugging the judge um, until the judge finally uh, gave her what she was asking for just because he wanted her to stop bugging her. And and Jesus says, you know, if, if that persistence paid off even before an unjust judge, how much more is it going to pay off before God who, who loves you for it? So telling us to, to pray persistently. Um, he answers those persistent prayers because he cares for us. Um, let's do the conclusion one. Evaluate this quote. God will use that time of constant prayer when our mind is on him and his word to help us see in clearer fashion his love, wisdom, and power. Due to his love, God wants the best for us. Due to his wisdom, God knows what is best for us. And due to his power, God can accomplish that which is best for us. Maybe I just like this because he did the three thing. I always like doing three things. But um, but uh, explain this quote. What do, you, what do you see in there? What do you like in there? Anything you dislike in there? Due to his power. <laughs> okay. So we're praying, trusting in his power, knowing that he can accomplish what's going to be best. Yep. Anything else you like in there? Well, there's stuff I like. I like what I don't really like. Like that he knows what's best for us. Okay. I just want to be right. Okay. So, yep. But it's good that he does. Yeah. What's best. Yep. I think a hard one. For those that aren't saved, because due to his love, God wants the best for us. He wants the best for everybody, but there's still those that don't get that, yeah. right? Because they're in unbelief. So yeah. it's great for us, right? Not so good for you. Yeah. There's a lot of times I can look back and watch it. I pray one day and come back for. Well, yeah. Thank God for listening to my needs. Isn't that a country song? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I thank God. Yeah. For unanswered prayers. Well, you know what? Yeah. I, I love this part about 
that he uses the time and constant prayer when our mind is on him and his word to help us see in clearer fashion his love, wisdom, and power. I think a lot of times we think about our time in prayer as being, this is for me to ask God for stuff, which it is, but what's the point? So that I see what he's doing more and more. If I'm asking him for what's best for me, if I'm asking him, um, you know, I don't know how many times people have told me that, you know, they were praying, God, help this person get better, help them get better, help them get better. And then finally I prayed, Lord, let your will be done. And then God took them home to, to be with them forever in heaven. Um, and, and they're like, oh, I see it now. Right. You know that that. OK, this is what what God's doing. Um, and so often. That's what prayer does for us in that it, it helps us to get our mind right. If I'm going through life and I'm so busy and everything's going wrong and, you know, uh, whatever, and I'm not spending that time in prayer, I see all the things that aren't like I would like them to be. When I'm taking time to, to be in prayer and think about God's word and his will, the same stuff might be happening, but I'm seeing God's love, wisdom, and power behind it. Um, yeah, I figured I put this quote on here, and everybody would have a different part that they that that, that jumped out at them. But but that was that was the reason I put it on, just because it's so much like that that prayer of um, what is Elijah or Elisha Elisha when his when they were surrounded uh, by the enemy and and uh, he prayed, Lord, open his eyes so he can see. When his servant said, oh, I, you know, we're in trouble, Beth, Master, uh, the enemy's here, and and. The prophet says, "Those who are with us are more than those who are with them," and 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 Lord, open his eyes so that he can see. The reality is the reality. God's in charge, right? God's got this. As we pray, our eyes start to open to see that more and more, and we are out of time. So that will be our our closing here. Your assignment: write a prayer using some of the lessons we've learned from Elijah. So you can you can email that prayer to me or text that prayer to me. Um, Let's close with prayer. Lord God, thank you for your promises. Help us to hold you to them. Thank you for the privilege of praying. Help us to use it regularly that we may see your love and wisdom and power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.